This is a set of graphs you find in 1312. And again, it's one of those sets of graphs that takes some studying. And it's also one of those graphs that's worth a thousand, if not a million, if not billions of words. And in fact, oceanographers have spent many years, if not decades, talking about, discussing, and researching these graphs. Because what we see here are variations in the abundance of phytoplankton, as shown in green, and zooplankton, as shown in brown, throughout the year in four different environments. Here we have the polar oceans, here we have the subarctic Atlantic and the subarctic Pacific. These are regions that we live in. And here we have the equatorial ocean, also the center, the central regions of the oceans, what are known as the gyres, a topic we'll get into when we talk in chapter nine about ocean circulation. So let's examine this a bit and let's start with the subarctic Atlantic. Phytoplankton grow, increase in abundance, and reach a peak somewhere in March or April. They decrease in abundance in May and June and July and pop up again a little bit in September and then decrease through the winter months. So here we have phytoplankton increasing in abundance in the spring decreasing in abundance through the summer, increasing a little bit in abundance in the fall, and being very low in concentration in the winter time. Zooplankton kind of mirror the phytoplankton in the subarctic Atlantic, in the North Atlantic Ocean. They don't exactly match it because it takes a while for them to increase their numbers, so phytoplankton grow very quickly and zooplankton growing more slowly are now feeding on these phytoplankton and growing more quickly. So they reach their mass, their maximum abundance in mid-May, June, somewhere in this period of time, in early summer, late spring, early summer. They then decrease in abundance and then they have a little bump in October as well that is a result of the increase in phytoplankton in the fall. So what we see here is that in the subarctic Atlantic, that zooplankton abundance is tracking phytoplankton abundance. And this is going to be something really important to remember when we talk about food webs. Remember, all life in the ocean, at least in the upper ocean, is going to be dependent upon the phytoplankton. As the phytoplankton go, that's how food webs go. If phytoplankton grow and reproduce, then zooplankton are going to grow and reproduce. And we were able to add on small fish and other kinds of organisms here, we would see that on up through the food web that other organisms are going to track the abundance of phytoplankton. Okay, so this is a classic graph of the relationship between phytoplankton and zooplankton in the world ocean in subarctic and many temperate oceans as well. Let's now look at polar oceans. What we see in polar oceans, and what you should remember in, in our discussion of chapter seven, is that it only gets warm really in the summer. And that's really when we have stratification. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes in relation to primary productivity. But we really only have one season in polar oceans. And we see that dramatically as we see this enormous increase of phytoplankton in the polar oceans in the summer months. And that increase in phytoplankton is soon a month or so later followed by an increase in zooplankton. One major bloom of phytoplankton, one major bloom of zooplankton, as opposed to the one major and minor bloom of phytoplankton and the one major and minor bloom of zooplankton in the subarctic Atlantic, okay? Different locations in the world ocean different kinds of rates of production. Um, and again, these are being controlled by the seasonal variability of sunlight, mostly. Now, let's look at what's happening down at the equator or in the central gyres of oceans. 
here we basically see productivity kind of bouncing around of both the phytoplankton and of the zooplankton as well. There's no real clear pattern, no, no real clear jump in abundance um, for either of those. Why would that be? Why would a place like Hawaii, for example, really not be very productive for phytoplankton? And why would it have relatively low concentrations of phytoplankton? There's lots of light, right? What else limits phytoplankton growth? Light and nutrients. That's it. There are not in the surface waters of tropical oceans the availability of nutrients is limiting their growth and there's really no seasonal change in the tropics that's why we go to the tropics for crying out loud because it's always nice and sunny but that nice and sunny creates a stratified water column in which nutrients never really mix up back into the surface waters they do on occasion we have storms and those kinds of things but for the most part the concentration of phytoplankton as well as the concentration of zooplankton remain in balance and the processes uh, the the equatorial the tropical environments are very stable and very steady environments now we come to the final panel the subarctic pacific and this graph is really based on a lot of work that was done by the university of washington and other um, universities at a place called Station P. Here what we see is something very unusual. The concentration of phytoplankton really remains rather constant with a small bump in the fall. And the concentration of zooplankton reaches this huge peak in summer months and that's it. The question is why? The answer is there is no easy answer. Some people think that because many of the phytoplankton here are very small, that there's a whole other set of processes that go on. Um, and other people think that these zooplankton are eating the phytoplankton as fast as they're multiplying. So if this was not a measure of productivity, but a measure of growth rate, we would actually see phytoplankton growing faster the problem is they're getting eaten as fast as they grow. So I won't leave you with a very satisfactory explanation for this, only to say that um, we don't always have these classical pictures that we always think of because every environment is unique. It has a unique set of species, a unique set of conditions. And so one of those puzzles of oceanography, what's happening up in the subarctic Pacific. And people are still studying it today and you can go into the literature and, and find some of the emerging conclusions about this area. There's some people also that think there may be iron limitation going on up here. So I'll leave it at that. But these classic patterns, the tropics, the classic temperate or subarctic conditions, and the polar oceans are the ones that we want to keep in mind. One big bloom in polar oceans two blooms in temperate latitudes and really no blooms in equatorial latitudes. Those are the common and familiar and sort of classic patterns of phytoplankton and zooplankton growth in the world ocean.